Fire Emblem Engages Somnio is a hub area where you can perform crucial army management tasks that are critical to any typical playthrough. I have already beaten the game without using the Draconic Time Crystal, so this time I have decided to crank up the difficulty, up the ante, and beat the game on its hardest difficulty without resetting, reloading, or rewinding, and additionally not using any of the Somnio's features. I will be playing on Maddening Difficulty as an Iron Man challenge, which means that I cannot reset maps or use the Draconic Time Crystal for any reason, meaning that Mistakes are permanent and dead characters stay dead. If I fail the run, then I must start over from the beginning. In this No Somnio playthrough, I will also not enter the Somnio or use any of its features, excepting the few cases where I am forced inside, and if I am, I will leave immediately and not use any of the amenities, discarding or not using any bonus items that are forced on me. To summarize the features that I cannot use under this restriction, I cannot forge or engrave weapons, eat meals or stat bonuses, fight in the arena for bonus experience, upgrade bond levels by spending bond fragments, and Inherit skills from emblems onto my characters, obtain any bond rings, use the mysterious well, or any other miscellaneous Somnio feature. I also cannot access any DLC content, including the additional paralogs, emblem bracelets, or the Felizian log, because their use requires Somnio access. Online features will also be turned off for this run. Overall, a significant number of advantages and features available in the normal game are simply inaccessible, and the game will be much more difficult than normal. My army will be much weaker than in a typical playthrough due to lack forges and graves and skills and many strong strategies that most players might use are simply unavailable. So you might be wondering, with all these restrictions, what's left? I will still be able to use the 12 base game emblems and features that are available from the world map are still available, such as the item shop and armory. I can also advance bond and support conversations because those are also accessible from the world map. I am allowed to play all of the base game paralogs and can also try my luck with a few skirmish maps that are available in Madden difficulty, though these are typically extremely dangerous and provide very little material benefit. All of this sums up to what I consider to be a purer version of the Fire Emblem Engage experience, the ultimate challenge so to speak, or I will have to rely solely on emblem mechanics and uninvested characters because I have barely any resources to invest. I will need to pull out every stop and use every trick, exploit, and cheese strategy I have at my disposal to make my way through. And by eschewing nearly every mechanic that people could possibly consider overpowered or unfair, maybe I can finally beat the game for real. I began my first attempt of this No Somnio Engaged challenge by naming the main character Bleer to establish a naming convention that will soon be clear. The prologue in No Somnio Engaged is absolutely identical to that of a normal playthrough, except for Alir's imminent housing situation. Here we face Sarban, who is an evil fell dragon monarch who seeks absolute power, but even worse is the vice president of the local homeowners association. Because of Lethos' outdated laws that grants homeowners associations in order amounts of legal authority, Sarban has the power to impose fines for non-compliance of HOA bylaws, and uses this to impose a $20 fine on Alir because the Somnio has a section of fence that is non-compliant to standardized association colors. Alir slays Sabran, but this is not enough to overturn the penalty, and according to the association's constitution, a lien is automatically placed on the Somnio which gives the board the legal right to seize the property because of the failure to meet HOA obligations. Alir wakes up to find that this nonsensical sequence of events was all a fake flash forward fire and Permission, but unfortunately, the antiquated laws of Lethos dictate that HOA decisions made in dreams are still legally binding. In chapters 1 through 3 of No Sonyo Engage, my goal is to actively trade as much bond rank as possible, since I cannot simply purchase it with bond fragments. Early chapter gameplay, just like with that of most Fire Emblem games, is largely completely identical in all playthroughs, and ultimately winds up not being very interesting. Chapter 1 is just a tutorial map where you have a leader fight a bunch of corrupted, and chapters 2 and 3 have trivially optimal clears with little room for diversity since most of the characters you have at this point are not even worth using. Under the No Somnio restrictions, the early Faraday and Lethal's characters are at most a last resort because they require too much investment to patch up their deficiencies. With that said, I managed to cap out Alira's North Bond level, meaning that I would need to view the Bond composition to advance it further. After completing Chapter 3, I am forced into the Somnio, obtaining the Fire Emblem Heroes Bond Rings and Weapons against my will. These cannot be discarded, so I would just have to not use them. I leave immediately to up Hold the sanctity of my arbitrary self-imposed limitations, but forget to view Marth's bond conversation, leaving me incapable of leveling it further.
further in the next chapter. In chapter 4 of No Somni Will Engage, we get Saline, Louie, and Chloe who are all pretty good. I move all my characters to the right and hoe up at the bridge to take out the enemies and free the majority of XP to Saline and Louie just like I've always done in my previous runs. I finally remember to do my bond conversations and rank Alir up to level 5 with Marv and then enter chapter 5 of No Somni Will Engage which is the first chapter with real differences from that of a typical playthrough. Mainly because I do not have the free steel or silver weapons that most people get from entering the Somnio. As a result, I only have iron weapons, making my characters much weaker than usual. To compensate for this, I play much more passively and even give up on the treasure. I fail to obtain the armor slayer and obstruct that from the upper left. I open the door to the boss room, but unfortunately I eventually get overwhelmed and Fram dies to save Vander, marking my first casualty of the run, but it definitely won't be the last. Next up for no Somnio engage is the John Paralog, which is actually a little difficult if we do it immediately. I rush forward thinking that the enemies attacking the green units will not aggro on me, but unfortunately they do and they kill Chloe immediately. I do manage to recruit John who has potential to be a good unit, but in a no Somnio run, the difficulty of trading his weapon proficiency is complicates his use. I then move on to chapter 6 of no Somnio engage where we get Yunaka, who is not very good in this playthrough because daggers are very weak when not forged. I move cautiously in the fog of war and manage to get Alir to max bond to use the Mercurius for bonus experience and clear the map without any casualties. I then dive into Anna's paradox where we can recruit Anna who is potentially good for her high magic and speed growths. I move Louie and Saline extremely aggressively to rescue Anna and leave Alfred and John behind, thinking that they can survive on their own. This would normally be the case, but Alfred is hit by a 3% critical hit, killing him and causing John to be cornered and killed as well. In Chapter 7 of No Somnio Engage, we get Alcris, Citrine, and Lapis. Alcris and Lapis have strength issues that make them difficult to use, but Citrine is a powerful but slow and squishy mage. I use my first master shield to promote Saline into a Vadam to get her to Ignis faster. At this point, I begin to really feel the absence of the Chapter 5 Armor Slayer as none of my physical units can really damage any of the armors. Alcris helps greatly by one-shotting flyers and I manage to clear the map and set up the boss kill relatively easily by baiting with Boucheron and then jumping Hortensia with everyone on my team. This leads right into Chapter 8 of No Somnio Engage where we get Diamant and Amber. Diamant isn't very good because of hit rate issues due to his low deck and Amber is in one of the worst possible class lines and cannot easily gain weapon proficiency. I decide to allocate my second master CEO to Louis to promote him to a great knight to improve his mobility. This chapter puts a significant strain on my army because of my underpowered weapons, but the tools that you are given are still largely enough to make it through. I take out initial enemies by putting Alcris on the ballista and snipe flanking enemies with Louis paired with Sigurd. Once Ivy starts moving in, I just back up and have everyone swarm her the moment she gets into range, and I manage to cure the kill with enough leeway to even get the extra a secret book. We then go into chapter 9 of No Somnio Engage where I decide to make suboptimal use of my limited resources and reclass Amber into a lance armor for the misguided purpose of beating the endgame by spamming high defense units, a strategy inspired by the success of characters like Louis in my previous runs. On this map, we recruit Jade in Axe Armor who honestly is not very good. My game plan at this point is to cubely armors the higher defense the enemy attack to try to trivialize math by taking no damage. And needless to say, this is a stupid idea but uh... Anyway, Anyway, chapter 9 goes off without a hitch. I beat the boss and move on. In chapter 10 of No Somnio Engage, I promote Citrine into a Sage, and for reasons beyond my own comprehension, I reclass Vander into an Axe General. At this point in the game, Vander has already fallen off hard, so this at least gives him enough defense to take a few more hits. This map is the first of a two chapter sequence and has two distinct phases. The first phase pits us against Hortensia and her retainers. Hortensia is initially stationary, but her retainers advance towards us from two sides. Louis is an absolute MVP using Sigurd to zoom around the map even though his damage is a lot worse due to his poor equipment. In a standard playthrough I would have already forged him a silver raid lance but here I am still stuck with iron. I take down Rosado and Goldmary and then prepare for Hortensia who has special AI where she will not move on her first action and will instead use her freeze staff. I line up outside her range and then move in all at once to take her down. In the second phase of the map we are supposed to open a door to fight Corrupted Morian and then King Hyacinth but I don't want to take any risks so I decide to choose the hell out of the map. I use Rewarp to teleport a unit over the wall and then back again to aggro the bosses and Corrupted Morian gets stuck on the door, unable to progress, so I just kill him with 3 range at absolutely no risk. After Corrupted Morian goes down, Hyacinth moves in, using Astro Storm to no effect, and then he also gets stuck on the door, where he can be repeatedly shot from 3 range at no risk to myself. After whittling Hyacinth down, I break open the door to squeeze a bit more XP out of the map before defeating him to end the chapter. Chapter 11 of No Side Neo Engage is one of the more precarious chapters in the game where our emblem rings are taken from us and we are forced into a retreat. In preparation, I promote Alcris to fight the fly 
matters on this map a bit more effectively, and I move south as quickly as I can, but I accidentally leave Citri in range of an enemy, and because of her low physical bulk and extremely bad speed, she is immediately doubled and killed. Amber is too slow to retreat with the rest of the group, so I give him some vulnerabilities and intentionally leave him behind as he sacrificed to stall the pursuing enemies as long as possible. I fight through the corrupted ring bearers, and Amber takes a lot of punishment before finally being murdered by Warp Ragnarok. Amber's sacrifice has bought me some time, and I managed to reach the halfway point of the map, where I receive reinforcements, and the emblem rings are recalled from the corrupted to be given to the four hounds, making nearby enemies much weaker. Here we get Zelkov, Ivy, and Kagetsu. Zelkov isn't very good because of the lack of dagger forges, but Ivy is a decent unit with an important niche of being a flying tome and staff user. Kagetsu overall is one of the best units for this challenge because of his excellent base stats and all around high strength, speed, and most importantly, accuracy. With this additional help, I managed to punch through the remaining corrupted and escape to finish the chapter without crippling losses. And speaking of crippling losses, I decided to immediately try the Lucina Paralog far earlier than I should, and I find that my units are extremely underleveled, which owes me results in Lucina murdering Louis with a critical hit from her rapier. Right after chapter 11, we are forced to enter the Somnio, granting me a large variety of weapons and items against my will. The list of these non-consensual gifts include a bunch of steel and silver weapons, and many stat boosters, all of which I discard to preserve the sanctity of this run. We are also given a total of 33,000 gold, which I get rid of entirely by donating to Firene and then discarding the steel sword I obtain as a bonus. All the other rewards, such as ingots or bond fragments, cannot be used in this run anyway, so no special disposal method is needed. After this cleanup is done, I leave the Somnio immediately and enter chapter 12 of No Somnio Engage, which is a breather chapter. And here we recruit Fagato, Bude, and Pandreo. Fagato is an alright unit, but Bude is very bad, while Pandreo is probably one of the best mages in the game. This map doesn't amount to much aside from routing the enemies for XP, so I do that and move on to chapter 13 of No Somnio Engage, which is a fog of war map where we are constantly flanked by flyers. On this map, we get Tamara, who is fast and bulky, but has issues doing damage, Panette, who is normally very strong, but is lacking without inherited skills and engraves, and Marin, who is probably one of the best dagger users available to me. I pair Saline with Lin to give her Speed Taker, allowing her to easily sweep many enemies with her Levin Sword, and with this, I even managed to move fast enough to secure the rescue staff with a lower left. I face the twin banded brother bosses of this map, but don't have enough power to actually defeat them cleanly, risking death in enemy phase. But fortunately, I get very lucky and Panette pulls off a sweet double dodge, securing me an undeserved bloodless victory, which is clearly the best kind. Chapter 14 of No Somnio Engage pits us against the Four Hounds and Hortensia and features some very important treasure. The lack of forging in this playthrough means that many strong weapons are very limited in quantity. The Radiant Bow in particular is a 19 might magical bow, which is easily forged but only shows up in the shop much later in the game. This map has a Radiant Bow and securing it is one of my highest priorities, so I decided to move all of my forces to secure it. On the way there, Panette performs quite well on this map armed with Ike and I managed to capture a thief to secure the Radiant Bow and the boots so I let the treasure on the left go. Fortunately, the loot on the other side is just a Worm Slayer and a Silver Spirit Art, which are completely useless to me. I then move towards the bosses, but unfortunately, as I do this, I misclick and Marin is killed by a Javelin. To add further insult to injury, my controllers run out of battery, so I had to switch to my backup controllers, which have also run out of battery, resulting in an awkward dance of repeatedly swapping out controllers to charge to keep the stream going. Once I have control over the game again, I get to the center of the map. The five bosses can be cheesed by luring them out individually with Astro Storm, and I use this exploit to defeat each of the four hounds and Hortensia individually to clear the map without further risk. In Chapter 15 of No Somnio Engage, I use a second seal to reclass Panette into a general, with the logic being that her speed is horrible and unsalvageable anyway, and that increasing her defense can make her more useful, but ultimately, it does not. On this map, we recruit Seedal, who is a dancer that is indispensable to any playthrough. Seedal is unfortunately a lose condition on this map, so I have to be careful, as without intervention, he could die very quickly. I use a rescue staff to get him out of danger, and then proceed to the long excruciating process of playing this map, which consists of a series of isolated rooms that you clear in sequence. Halfway through the map, four extremely strong warriors spawn and pursue you. In any normal playthrough, I would be strong enough to fight these guys for bonus experience, but their defenses are very high, and my damage is lacking because of the no Somnium restrictions. My team is really starting to feel the lack of skills, forges, and engraves, and it is increasingly rare for any of my units to run on any enemy at this point. With this 
in mind, I decide to turn tail and run to the exit as fast as I can. I speed through the last two rooms with my recently acquired Byleth and Corrin emblems to move faster and clear miasma. I make it to the last room with the warriors hot on my heels, but with the ice dragon vein, I manage to stall them long enough to escape without fighting them at all. And in my infinite wisdom, I decide to waste even more resources to reclass Panette into a great knight to see if it makes her useful, but it does not. In chapter 16 of No Somnio Engage, we get Gold Memory and Rosado. Gold Memory has a ton of defense and mediocre offenses, and Rosado is potentially useful but requires a lot of training to get there. This map has a gimmick where the water level is periodically changed to open or close off movement between areas, and there's treasure on this map in the form of a recover staff in the upper left, but it's not worth getting, so I decided to go to the bottom island instead. I put Korin onto a Leer and make extensive use of the Flame Dragon Vein to grill E throttle enemy movement, and I fare very well against the enemies, using the terrain to my advantage, but the area I am holed up in is quite cramped. In order to make room for a risky play that ends up not paying off, I decide to have Panette fight some dagger users, but I find that her defense as a Great Knight is actually very mediocre and she is doubled and killed by a Griffin. Overall, it seems that in this challenge, any unit with either low speed or accuracy will nearly always end up being completely worthless, and this is not only because of the lack of external resources that patch their weaknesses, but because of a catch-22 situation for unit training. Without reliable damage, units cannot defeat enemies to gain levels, and without levels, they cannot defeat enemies, meaning that units that are not initially good can never really get off the ground. Even if a unit is potentially good when reaching their level cap, the sheer difficulty of the leveling process in the No Somnio Challenge can make the prospect of using them a complete non-starter. A loss of a net fortunately does not result in a snowballing cascade of casualties, and I manage to stabilize, cleaning up all the remaining enemies for XP, and then I defeat the boss to end the chapter. Chapter 17 of No Somnio Engage has us face off against 6 powerful bosses and a variety of extremely strong enemies. This will be one of the biggest challenges of the run, and is an extremely risky chapter if I try to play normally. The intended experience on this map is to proceed through in a clockwise fashion, but by approaching from the intended angles, you are forced into open terrain to face entire waves of enemies all at once. Unfortunately, my team is underleveled and underpowered, so if I try a conventional approach, I will die. Instead, I develop a cheese strategy that can allow me to defeat all 6 bosses on a more individual basis. In preparation, I do a quick skirmish map to grind bond rank to get Pedreo to a level 20 Lucina bond for more speed. I don't gain any XP from this because the enemies are too low level. Also, Hortensia joined the team at the end of chapter 14, but I forgot that she did, until I was reminded by a YouTube comment that thought this was an intentional bit, but it was not. I actually just forgot. Hortensia is very useful for her flying staff utility, but her combat is lacking. I begin the map and move up immediately to fight Gris, who uses Warp Bracken Rock to move right to me. Many of my units are very slow and are liable to be killed on the counterattack, so I have Ivy use a Divine Post Enhanced Silence Staff to silence him and make him unable to counterattack, and then defeat him by jumping with everyone on my team. And now, here comes the cheese strategy. Instead of going to the left, I instead go up into Gris's starting area. The upper right region is an island only connected to the rest of the map by two one-tile bridges, which can serve as excellent choke points. I use Astrostorp to lure Marty and Malviard into this region, and I make extensive use of Flame Dragon Veins and Dreadful Aura Freezes to separate them. This allows me to isolate Malviard, but I have to silence him so he doesn't kill me on the counterattack with his tomes. His defenses also hold up surprisingly well, and I'm only barely able to take out one of his health bars, but I get bailed out by a lucky 69 damage crit from Goldberry. Defeating Marnie is a lot simpler, if more tedious because she has holdout, but after many attacks, she also goes down. We now come to the final challenge of the map, which is the trio of Zephia, Veil, and Corrupted Hyacinth. In a normal circumstance, you would fight them in the lower left of the map, and Zephia will immediately rush you, followed quickly by the other two bosses in sequence. This can be extremely overwhelming because that area of the map is extremely open. If we don't have enough damage to take them out quickly, then you are in extreme danger. I do not have any damage, so the conventional approach is a non-starter. However, if we hide in the upper right island, after luring the bosses with Astro Storm, Zephia will separate herself from the rest of the group immediately because she is a flyer with enhanced movement. She will fly over the water and arrive many turns ahead of Veil and Hyacinth. I bait Zephia into using Override, but I fail to trap her and she manages to cancel her away into a very inconvenient spot, and I am just barely able to take her down after attacking with my entire army. Veo and Hyacinth then move in, much more slowly, but they arrive with around a dozen allies which are a huge problem. So I make extensive use of the bridge choke points and flames dragon veins to slow them down and take them out one by one until their numbers are reduced. I manage to bait away Hyacinth, but find that he is too tanky to kill, even with my entire army on standby. I don't even manage to take out a single one of his health bars on the first turn, and I have to scramble to surround him so he doesn't kill someone important. I sacrifice Tamara for the cause, but he hits her with quadruple strike, which she somehow survives.
survives. The remaining healers heal Hyacinth back up to full HP, but I manage to follow up and take him out on the next turn. This leaves only Veil. I first back up a bit to take out the remaining enemies, and then I repeatedly do chip damage to her by using the Fire Dragon Vein's damage over time effect. Unfortunately, she has self healing from unyielding, so this only goes so far. I finally let her approach me, and then hit her with a Silent Staff to nullify her counter attacks, and then jump her, just barely taking her down and completing one of the hardest chapters in this challenge with zero losses. I then decide to play some Emblem Paralogs to prepare for the endgame. By completing these Paralogs, we can increase the maximum bond rank of our Emblems to 20, which grants many benefits such as bonus stats, additional skills, and Emblem weapons. Since I am otherwise unable to access skills and good weapons due to the no summoning restrictions, this is one of the main ways I can increase the power of my army. I begin with Lin's Paralog, which at this point in the game should not be too bad. This map begins with their units being split into three groups into three corners of the map. I start by reuniting everyone into one group and then decided to try to farm enemies for XP. I have Golden Mary hold a one tower choke point and stall the enemy forces with fire dragon veins. However, this is a delicate process and the sheer number of enemies that stack up cause problems. One of these problems is that uh, Fogato was killed by a longbow bone knight. Further complicating matters is that a significant fraction of my army consists of flyers at this point and the sheer number of enemy bow users limits my actions. More specifically, Emblem Lin can use Asher Storm, which is effective against flyers. While most of my armory can survive it, it has such a large range that nearly anyone can be targeted. Lin targets Hortensia, has her unique dialogue with her, and then immediately shoots her until she dies. At this point, I have given up entirely on trying to farm XP and decided to end the map immediately to stop further losses. I attack Lin multiple times and then finish her off with a twin strike, completing the map with many more losses than gains. Next up in No Somnio Engage is the Byleth Paralogue, which is not a map I should be doing this early. Even though this map has a gimmick where the majority of enemies will avoid attacking your units in favor of destroying crystals that are placed around the map, the foes you face in this chapter are extremely tanky and surprisingly powerful. I begin by spreading my units around the map, defeating several isolated enemies, before reuniting to face the first main challenge, the two fabrication worms and the two squads of aggressive enemies that prioritize fighting you over breaking crystals. I clear one worm by attacking with Gold Mary and Pandreo, and the other with Gold Mary, Pandreo, and Ivy. The aggressive enemies approach, and because of my carelessness, Ivy is one shot by a silver bolt archer, and everything starts to unravel. I fall back to the upper left, but I cannot retreat further, and I get surrounded. Soon after, Kagetsu is killed by an archer, Rosado by a halberdier, and then Saline dies as well, killed by an archer. At this point, my formation has completely collapsed, and there's not much left to do except wait for the end. In a vain attempt to stabilize this unsalvageable situation, I get to mirror killed a player phase and then end my turn. A leader gets doubled by a griffin and dies, ending the first attempt of this No Somnio Engage Iron Man in complete and utter failure. For my second attempt at No Somnio Engage, I name my main character Clear. I start this playthrough immediately after I lose the previous one as a salty run back and I play as fast as I can to make up for lost time. But I end up playing so fast that I immediately screw up and get Louis killed in chapter 4, so I just give up and pretend the run didn't happen. In my second attempt of No Somnio Engage, I choose to name named Delir, and run through the early game as quickly as I can. I clear everything up to chapter 7 quite cleanly without any losses, but in chapter 8, Lapis is killed by Ivy because of poor positioning. Later in chapter 10, when fighting Hortensia, I manage to clear her troops but Hortensia moves and she one rounds Alchrist. I use the same door trapping cheese strategy against Morian and Hyacinth and then proceed to chapter 11. In this run, I have noticed Alir's potential for being a strong combat unit and I have reclassed her into a great knight to use her as one, and I mainly decide to invest in Saline, Louie, and Chloe. But Regardless, because of my haste, I entered the escape chapter overconfident and underprepared. To compensate for the loss of Alchris in chapter 10, I promote Anna into a warrior so she can use bows, but I forget to give her any bows. This means that enemy flyers armed with emblems end up being very menacing and end up soaking up way too many hits, slowing me down significantly. Because of my hubris, I choose not to use intentional sacrifices to slow the enemy down, a mistake I will soon regret. Ember is the first to fall, and soon after, Bander is hunted down with Sigurd's Rider's Bane. I desperately tried to reach the halfway point in the map to trigger allied reinforcements, but I failed to make it in time. Because Louis is sniped by Warp Ragnarok, and at this point, any semblance of a plan has now been shattered. What follows is simply a massacre of my remaining forces. Citrine is one tapped by an Iron Great Axe, Fram is killed by an Iron Great Lance, and finally, Alir is doubled with Celica's Seraphim Tome, killing her and ending this No Somnio attempt. For my third attempt at No Somnio Engage, I name my main character, Elir. I speed through the early game just like my previous attempts and get Entia and Chloe killed on Chapter 4, with Bushra on 
and dying on Chapter 5. The rest of the run goes quite smoothly until Chapter 9, when Jade is killed because of a critical hit. This time, instead of reclassing Alir into a Great Knight, I've decided to use her as a Wyvern Knight in order to take advantage of her high speed. Alir performs extremely well as a Wyvern, dominating the early game and allowing me to easily clear much of Chapter 10 until I get to Hortensia. I line up outside her range and then attack all of her forces, wiping out nearly all of her allies but leaving her untouched. I do this because of an AI quirk where Hortensia does not move on her first turn and will instead use her free staff instead of moving to attack. However, what I didn't realize is that she actually can attack on her first turn if units are within her stationary attack range. Fun fact, on this map Hortensia has the Luin which does effective damage against dragons. When I was clearing all of the enemies, I ended up placing Alir adjacent to Hortensia under the assumption that she would just use her free staff, but instead she attacks Alir with a Luin, striking her for 37 effective damage and instantly killing her, ending this no Somnio run in one of the stupidest ways possible. In my fourth attempt at no Somnio engage, I named my main character Fleer then proceed through the early game even faster than before. On the way, Alfred dies in Chapter 5 and Boucheron in Chapter 6, and I make a very ill-advised Warp Ragnarok play that leaves Saline stranded and gets her killed. Vander also dies in Chapter 6, which does not bode well for the run, but regardless, I press on. As I play the Anna Paralog, Lapis is killed by a 5% critical hit, which is, well, unfortunate. And in Chapter 9, I lose John in a sacrifice play to try to save better units. This time, I've heavily shifted my investment into Wyvern Knight Alir and a Griffin Knight Chloe, as well as Ada, who I train extensively using Great Sacrifice spam. So, I clear Chapter 10 using the standard cheese. In Chapter 11, I have reclassed Anna into a warrior and have given her bows this time, and with these bow users, I am able to take down fire as quickly and efficiently. I move down as quickly as I can, but unfortunately, Citrid is doubled and killed because of her low speed, and Jade is killed by yet another critical hit. But this time, I managed to move faster than before and get to the end of Chapter 11, relatively unscathed. Chapter 12 goes by in a flash, so I go into Chapter 13, which was not a problem in my first playthrough. Chloe, who is now a Griffin Knight, is one of my stronger units, but on turn 1, she is immediately doubled and killed by an enemy Swordmaster that has 23 speed because she was weighed down by a Steel Lance. With this death, I have lost a significant portion of my combat power, as much of my XP and resources had gone into training Chloe. As a result, I am forced to play much more defensively than I normally would. I decided to not break through obstructions and camp on the left side of the map. This causes me to lose out on the map's rescue staff, but I managed to just barely survive the powerful Wyvern reinforcements. After exhausting the reinforcements, I realized that the remaining enemies, including the bosses, are not moving, meaning I have accidentally discovered yet another cheese strategy. I move a single unit near the obstruction, and this causes only one out of the two Bandit Brother bosses to move towards me, while the other remains stationary. And this is because only one of the bosses has a 1-2 range act, so the other can only attack on one range. This allows me to get the boss with the tomahawk stuck on the obstruction, so I can defeat him from a complete safety from 3 range, making finishing the map much easier since I will no longer need to defeat both bosses at once. I open the obstructions and defeat the remaining enemies easily, followed by the second Banner Brother boss to complete the map. I decide to delay entering Emblem Paralog chapters, as in a no Somnia run they are much harder than usual. And so I move on to Chapter 14, which is a critical chapter for obtaining the Radiant Bow. I've been training Anna specifically to use the Radiant Bow, and she performs quite well with it. I use the same Astro Storm boss luring cheese from before to clear the bosses on this map. Move on to chapter 15, where I am able to use a Radiant Bow Anna with chain attacks from Lin's doubles to defeat the four overpowered warriors that are intended as an anti stalling mechanic, something I was previously unable to do. Chapter 16 also goes by much more smoothly than before because Wyvern Knight Alir is incredibly strong and allows me a lot more flexibility when fighting fires from a small island platform. After this map, I do the Lucina Paralogue, which I clear much more easily than in my first No Somnio attempt because of access to powerful emblems like Byleth and a huge level advantage. I then move on to chapter 17, quite confident in my position, so I use the same overall plan as before. I take out Gris first and then station myself on the upper right island, utilizing choke points and flame dragon veins to funnel isolated enemies into kill zones, forcing the 5 remaining bosses to separate themselves in terrain so I can take them out individually. I clear chapter 17 with no losses, finally getting me back to where I was in the first playthrough before I bungled the run by playing a parallel 
chapter for which I was extremely underleveled and underprepared. Chapter 18 of No Somnio Engage is a boat map where you are attacked from multiple directions and that features a variety of powerful enemies including a very large number of flying units. Because I cannot forge without the Somnio, my bows end up being surprisingly weak and I find it very difficult to be able to one round enemy flyers. As such, I am forced to resort to more unorthodox solutions. Enter the Hurricane Axe, a 20 might magical smash axe for which there is little practical use in normal circumstances, but my circumstances are anything but normal. And in this situation, it actually is quite good since the Hurricane Axe is effective against flyers, tripling its base might for a total of 60 magical might on the weapon alone. I give the Hurricane Axe to Kagetsu who is a Wyvern Knight and set him north immediately. I activate Great Ether with the Hurricane Axe and manage to catch 3 enemy flyers in this area of effect, causing massive damage to them but unfortunately not killing them. But regardless, this is a huge tempo swing that gives me the momentum I need to start the map. I use Fire Dragon Veins and Essential Flame Cannon to stall enemies as I fight desperately against the waves of increasingly tough enemies. At this point, I typically need multiple actions for multiple units to take on even one enemy. There is an optional speed wing that you can obtain on this map by catching a thief on the left boat, but actually going for it will be complete suicide because that is where the majority of enemy reinforcements spawn. While the allure of stat boosters is tempting, my army is simply not powerful enough to make the push to obtain it. The pressure gets so high that I become physically uncomfortable in real life due to the tension and the stakes at hand. I just barely manage to survive a turn where enemies target 4 Lin doubles instead of ganging up and killing my actual units, allowing me to recruit Linden who is a very useful magic user who would not realize his full potential as he will be spending nearly all of his time spamming flame dragon veins instead of fighting. At this point, I am extremely starved for mystical units since Sailing and Citrine are dead, meaning that there are very few mystical units that can be useful as a Koron user. I continue struggling against the enemies on this map, unable to rush the boss or really stabilize my situation, but as the last wave of enemies spawn, the boss becomes aggressive and starts moving towards me. The reinforcements are simply too numerous and powerful to fight without risk, so at this point I decide to bail, defeating the boss, just barely managing to beat the map without anyone dying. Chapter 19 of No Somnio Engage when played normally is a tough map where you fight a tremendous number of enemies, but fortunately it is very easy to cheese by means of a one tile choke point near the bottom of the map. This map tries to force you into a situation where your armies are split with a few units deployed on the top of the map cut off from the rest of your forces. However, I am able to counteract this by deploying several flying units and I just have them fly down immediately. I decide to reclass Meriden into a bow knight to very slightly increase her strength growth and also because I feel there is a need for more anti-air units in upcoming maps. Late game flyers have very high avoids so I theorize that the bow knight's class skill, careful aim, could potentially be useful for its conditional plus 40 hit. On this map, we can recruit Sapphire who is a middling unit that does not have a good first impression but can do well as a fiddler unit even if you don't train her. Since Aaliyah is a flying unit, I can just fly her over the gap immediately to recruit her and then dance to move her to safety. I have Gold Mary block the southern choke point which causes all the enemies to pile up to one gigantic harmless traffic jam. I defeat all of the two range enemies with three range longbows and then milk all of the experience I can from the remaining helpless one range foes. I consider trying to go for the Draco shield on this map but I get spooked when Marnie unexpectedly one shots Ivy from far away with the Worm Slayer Blazing Lion. She then follows it up by nearly killing Linden so I decide not to push my luck and I just get the fuck out of there. In order to make up a re recent losses, I decided to start some increasingly degenerate grinds and train my characters. But first, I enter Lin's Paralogue for some payback and to maximize her bond level so I can access the Moodle Gear, a 16 might bow that grants plus 5 speed. This time, I'm extremely overleveled for this map and manage to clear it easily. I then move on to Sigurd's Paralogue to grind XP. Sigurd's Paralogue is one of the few maps where you are left alone to your own devices. After clearing initial enemies, you can sit in complete safety until you decide to trigger the next phase of the map. So I equip Makai to Lui and and use Korin's Fire Dragon Veins to damage my own units, allowing me to heal them for XP. Great Sacrifice is useful for low level units, but the XP gain falls off drastically at high levels and quickly becomes non-viable. So instead, I charge Emblem Energy via cheaper heal staffs and then use Mikaia's Engage Skill Augment to repeatedly AoE men staff for increased XP gain. I continue this process for a while and manage to grant Louis 6 levels to go from level 12 to 18. I move on and whack Sigurd to complete the map. I then decide to enter a low level skirmish map to grind even more XP. 
XP. By using the same process, I repeat the Micaiah Augment Medstaff strat to train a Brazado, getting him from level 7 to 15, but near the end of this process I mess up by ending turn too quickly and allowing Anna to get hit by two 20% hits in a row, which results in her premature death. I then enter chapter 20 of No Somnio Engage, which is a fog of war jump scare map where Gris repeatedly harasses you with Ragnarok Warp. Fortunately, if you know about this in advance, you can just jump him immediately on the first turn. In order to replace Anna, who died in the skirmish map, I decided to try using Etie and train her by using the Micaiah emblem. I opened by using a Micaiah augmented Illum staff to identify Gris's location and then immediately take him down with Gagetsu and Meren to force him to retreat. I then camp in the right corner of the map, luring enemies and slowing them down drastically with fire dragon veins, allowing me to pick them off individually. I grind through all of them until none remain. And this leaves only the boss and his retinue which do not move aggressively unless you enter their range, granting me a ton of free training time. I give Etie XP by spamming obstruct stabs and using the fire dragon vein heal strategy to get her to level 20. But her speed is so fucking bad, holy shit, what the fuck? I then lure the boss and take him down quite easily. Next up in No Somnio Engage is the Micaiah Paralog, which I do mainly to obtain Thani, which has 11 might and does effective damage against armors and cavalry, which is pretty insane for a tome. Thani would allow even a relatively weak mage like Hortensia to one round late game enemies, when she would otherwise only be tossing out L Thunder for 7 damage. Because I lack weapon proficiency due to not having enough chapters to gain them, I am forced to promote Etienne to a sniper and I try to make her usable. Makai's Paralog can be quite challenging if you play it normally, but you can cheese it by luring the boss with an Astro Storm. So I have Etienne hit Makai from 20 range with Astro Storm and then bunch up as the enemies approach. Unfortunately, Makai does not move alone, meaning that defeating her now gets quite tricky. I use the flame cannons to create difficult terrain to try to funnel the enemies in a more manageable fashion, but their positioning still ends up being very awkward. So I had to spend many important actions for my stronger units just clearing enemies to reach the boss, but I managed to set up enough chain attacks for Etie to confirm the kill, giving her a very unimpressive level up. I follow up the previous map with the Ike Paralog. This map has many reinforcements that are just not worth fighting because most of them had Void Curse and don't grant XP, so I completed it quickly by rushing the boss. So then I decided to enter Roy's Paralog to get more XP and the Binding Blade, which is a very strong sword with high might, 1-2 range, and bonus defense and resistance. My plan is to use Roy on Alir for the massive strength bonus and for the increased survivability from holdout. Roy's Paralog is filled to the brim with Wyverns, with 7 approaching you almost immediately at the start of the map. These Wyverns have 54 HP and 15 resistance, for a total of 69 magical bulk, which also means that a unit with 9 magic armed with a Hurricane Axe has just enough damage to one-shot them. Coincidentally, Kagetsu has just enough magic to do this with a magic tonic. So I send Kagetsu out with Ike to do a Hurricane Axe Great Ether and manage to catch 4 Wyverns in their range, dealing 69 damage to each of them and getting a quadruple kill. On turn 2, I have Kagetsu wipe out another Wyvern and mop up the remnants with a bow users. Even more Wyverns spawn, and I continue clearing them with Hurricane Axe Kagetsu, granting him an absolute ton of much needed XP. Ideally, I need Kagetsu to get as strong as possible so he stands a chance at one rounding late game enemies. After clearing the map, I spend some time heal grinding Hortensia to make her a more capable combatant with Donnie at the endgame, and then take out Roy to finish the map. I then enter the Leaf Paralog, which is a dangerous chapter with many high level enemies, but also one that offers an opportunity to gain more experience. I'm very worried about the difficulty of upcoming main story chapters 21 and 22, so I want to be as powerful as I can before I attempt them. The Leaf's Paralog places you near several retreating Lancers, one of which has a speed wing, which will be extremely useful. So I have Hortensia used in Trap to kidnap and rob him with a stat booster, allowing the remainder to escape because the rewards aren't worth getting. It will be possible to chase them, but also dangerous because the Lancers retreat into enemy Ballista range. The Ballista Ballistas on this map have heightened might and accuracies, so advancing early into them is dangerous, because you will also have to deal with a veritable flood of cavalry reinforcements for many turns. Fighting these reinforcements fairly would be suicide, so instead I set up a funnel at the starting area. I have Linden use fire dragon veins to block the left side while Louis blocks the right, causing all of the one ranged melee cavalry to bunch up uselessly against the wall, allowing me to feed kills to Alir, Kagetsu, and Pandreo. I clear all of these enemies like shooting fish in a barrel, and then decide how their portrait remains of the map, and it ends up being relatively simple. I have Louis move south to clear the ballista, and then lure the enemies at the center of the map to be killed.
killed at my manufactured choke point. I then lure Leaf with an Astra Storm and take out his retinue of Mage Knights with a really sick overdrive. I defeat Leaf and move on to the next Paralog chapter. I decide to continue knocking out Paralog chapters to prepare for chapter 21 and 22, so I enter Byless Paralog, which was a chapter that ended my first playthrough. This time around, it isn't so bad because my units are not comically underpowered, so I take advantage of the non-aggressive enemies and defeat Byleth quite easily. I then move into Celica's Paralog, which has infinite Voidcrest reinforcements which can be a problem, but fortunately this map is cheesable. I bait Celica and she's using Warp Ragnarok from her far away starting position and then pile onto her, AoE warping in a whole squad to take her out. Finally, I move onto Erika's Paralog, which is a difficult chapter but is very important because it unlocks Looter Brace Plus and the Sea Glean Dig, which is a 12 might weapon that is effective against Corrupted, which comprised nearly every non-boss enemy in the endgame. On this map, many enemies immediately rush a starting position, but I manage to stall them with Flame Dragon Banes and take them out. Fires spawn in as I approach the boss, so I defeat them with Hurricane Axe to get to. After a while, the boss approaches me with a dense clump of enemies, but because they are so well packed, I am able to freeze most of them easily with Corrin. Erika goes down, and after completing 6 paralogs, I finally feel ready to continue the main story. Chapter 21 of No Sami You Engage is the first of a brutal Chu chapter gauntlet, where you are repeatedly attacked from multiple angles by groups of very powerful enemies. On this map, we get Malvier, who is an okay fiddler unit with a very bad starting class. The first challenge posed by this map is a formation of generals and snipers up north, and two corrupted worms at the sides. I deal with the western worm by attacking with Kagetsu and Louie, and I take out the eastern worm with a twin strike from Rosado. With the northern group, I activate Bonded Shield on Marin to protect Pandreo with a 100% activation rate because they're both cavalry units. Pandreo, having been trained extensively in the Paradox chapters, managed to defeat all five generals and two snipers on the enemy phase while taking zero damage. And this initial play gives me a ton of momentum and breathing room to deal with the reinforcements. Next up are some bow knights from the upper left and paladins from the upper right. I chip the bow knights with bonded shield Pandreo and the paladins with override. And with the first group already taken care of, this second wave is easily defeated. The third wave is a swarm of infantry and mages from both sides. I impede their progress with fire dragon veins and collapse onto the left flank, wiping them out while impeding the right flank with even more fire dragon veins. I pop Violet's Goddess Dance to defeat the incoming formation of 10 enemies, freezing the last one with Corrin to prevent any funny business. Then the bosses start moving. Gris moves in, but I manage to separate him from his troops and pick them off individually. And I lure in Zephyr's group by one-shotting a Wyvern with an Etsy Mulugiro Astro Storm, and use a variety of flyer effective weapons to take out the rest. I defeat Zephyr and then deal with a small squad of 4 flyers from the bottom, whose quantity makes them no issue. The last wave of reinforcements only spawns once you approach the boss, so I take some time to heal everyone up and recharge everyone's emblem gauges. Bayo cannot be leered on this map because she will generally remain in her starting area, so you must go to her to defeat her, something complicated by all of the enemies surrounding and blocking access to her. I organize and use a Makaya Enhanced Rewarp to teleport 5 units over and then dance to rescue in 5 more. I open it with a Torrential Roar to apply Draconic Hex and Water Terrain to Veil and hit her with a Momentum Booster Override, followed by a ton of Chain Attacks, the Binding Blade, and I finish her off with a Warp Ragnarok. And my Grand Reward for beating this brutal chapter, it's getting to watch a leader die in a cutscene. Chapter 22 of No Samuel Engage begins immediately after the previous one and strips us of our emblem rings, which is a problem as they comprise more than half of my army's power. Here we get our final character, Bale, who has a rough start this late in the game without skills or DLC, but has unique uses with certain emblems as a magic using dragon unit. I begin the map by going to the right and having Kogetsu defeat enemy royal knights with an obscure or strangely powerful weapon, the Poax. Normally there is no practical reason to use this piece of garbage because of its awful accuracy, low hit rate, high weights, and an awful 8 might for a weapon only effective against cavalry. But one man's trash is another's treasure, and all my other alternatives are even worse. Getsu is fast and accurate enough to use the Polox effectively, allowing me to have a 24 might weapon against cavalry, allowing him to run around late game mounted units where otherwise it would not be possible. And in this strange set of circumstances, I even end up finding myself using the Worm Slayer of all things to defeat Wyvern Knights. I believe this to be one of the only times anyone has ever used the Worm Slayer and Fire Emblem Engage. I continue taking out enemy Wolf Knights with the Kagetsu Poax and use support bonuses that grant Louie additional hit rate depending
catch up with shaky accuracy. I finally managed to reach and reclaim the first batch of 3 emblems, which unfortunately only gives skills and stat bonuses for this map, but it will do for now. I give Lin to Pandreo so he can have Speed Taker, and I have Pandreo and Marin fight the incoming Griffin Knights with Excalibur and Silver Bows. I focus on giving Pandreo Speed Taker stacks so he can double the enemies on this map. At this point, I've exhausted the normal set of reinforcements, so repeated waves of infinite Void Curse reinforcements start spawning from the bottom. One of these waves coincides with a massive linked enemy group, so I'm forced to retreat to deal with them. But I manage to split the enemies into two groups on terrain and fight them separately to stabilize the situation. I then start slowly advancing, stopping every few turns to clear Void Curse reinforcements. Fortunately, I can do this conveniently with Pandrea with complete reliability. One of the three Void Curse enemies always has a smash weapon, so he will always die before he can attack, and the other two don't do enough damage combined to kill Pandreo. I managed to reclaim two more emblems and then push to the bottom, luring out the groups in between reinforcement waves to reduce the burden on my army. I reclaim three more emblem rings and then approach the final pack. I clean up most of the threatening units so the remainder don't have enough to harm me, allowing me to reclaim the remaining emblem rings and completing this brutal chapter without any losses. The next story chapters in No Somnium Gates are a huge difficulty spike, so I decided to wrap up the remaining paralogues to finish up my endgame team composition. I start reassigning some emblems, which is a costly choice as training bond rank takes multiple chapters since I cannot buy bond rank in the Somnio. I decided to have Hortensia use Byleth instead of Makaya and then assign Makaya to an extremely underleveled Fram, who is one of the only staff users I have remaining. To train these units, I enter Corrin's Paralogue, which is easily warp skipped, but by doing that I won't gain XP, so I decided to fight the enemies normally. The deployment limit on this map is low, and I'm confident enough in my strength that I choose not to deploy my Dancer, which is a bad decision because the enemies end up being stronger and more numerous than I anticipate. This is further complicated by the presence of many bow users, which is a problem because more than half my team are wyverns. At the start of the map, only a few enemies approach, but around halfway through, Corrin dries up the water with a dragon bane, opening the map up completely, allowing many enemies to rush me. This results in Etsy being doubled and killed because of her low speed, which is unfortunate but honestly not that surprising. As I approach Corrin, I decide to spawn Lin doubles to distract enemies, but this actually gives Corrin a target for Torrential Roar, which ends up freezing Pandreo and Kagetsu. Luckily, Makaya is on Fran, who is a Chi Adept, so a great sacrifice from her acts as an AoE restorer, so I just barely managed to get away. After a complicated series of maneuvers, I managed to isolate Corrin and trap her, giving me free reign to grind Byleth Bond level on Hortensia, Makaya Bond level on Fram, Selica Bond level on Vale, and Lin Bond level on Pendreo. I managed to reach the Bond level cap on each of these characters for the next Bond conversations, and defeat Corrin to exit them. At this point in the game, there are only two paralogues left, Marth's paralogue and the Pactoring paralogue, both of which are extremely dangerous. The Pact Ring Paralogue is unfortunately too risky for the rewards it gives, especially since the Pact Ring cannot be used in this run, since you cannot get an S rank support without entering the bedchamber in the Somnio. Marth's Paralogue, on the other hand, is still quite difficult but is much easier due to having exploitable choke points, and being able to max out Marth's bond level at 20 is useful for its additional passive stat bonuses. Marth's Paralogue has treasure which is largely useless aside from a secret book on the lower left, and I have Louis chase him down with Sigurd to obtain it. I move forward immediately to entrap a warrior that opens the door to the right. If the warrior were able to open the door, it would cause every enemy in the throne room to become aggressive, so by entrapping him, we can delay this indefinitely. The positioning becomes awkward, so I have to entrap him two times to defeat him without entering the range of the sages in the throne room. If I trigger the aggression of any enemy in that area, the door will open and all of those enemies will move towards me immediately. I use fire dragon veins to stall heroes from the west and reinforce from the south, and make a fighting retreat to a choke point at the top of the map, but unfortunately my movement is extremely restricted restricted by the attack ranges of the throne room sages. Another problem arises when some of the enemy heroes start flanking me from the top. The sequence of movements ends up being very complicated and I screw up, resulting in Louis getting killed by 11 sword hero. But at this point, Louis was already starting to fall off anyway as his hit rates have become increasingly inconsistent. I managed to reach a choke point and continuously pick off enemies from the south by using fire dragon veins to stall them. After clearing all the enemies for experience, I take some time to do Makaya's staff guarding for Fram, making her into a level 20 martial master but unfortunately she is still not any good. I open the throne room door, causing Marth's mini boss squad to rush me, in addition to many Void Curse reinforcements, but I manage to get them stuck at the hallway choke boat to the Fire Dragon Veins. I continue feeding XP to my characters until Marth pokes out ahead of the group, allowing me to take him out to end the chapter. Chapter 23 of No Somnio Engaged features meteors falling from the sky and infinite freeze to have Griffinite reinforcements. Since Louis died last chapter, I have reallocated Sigurd to Seedal, which ends up being very useful because this is the only way I can get cancer to a dancer without skill inheritance. This chapter is normally extremely challenging because of its powerful foes and limited mobility on 
three stabs meteors and terrain. But fortunately, this can be alleviated by restore stabs and by cheesing the map. By leering the boss, you can significantly shorten the length of this chapter. And since Etie died, I instead equip Lin to an underlevel Yunaka to leer the boss with a 20 revenge Astro Storm. I do this on turn one, and it succeeds, causing Zephyr and Gris to start moving towards me. But I will still need to survive a formidable first wave of around two dozen enemies to beat the map. I leer and weaken the first group of adversaries with Bonded Shield of Andreo, and then finish them off on player phase. Next up are a pack of cavalry, which are weakened by Bonded Shield of Andreo, and four of them end up moving into a cross formation that's absolutely perfect for an AoE Corrin freeze. This is great since a group of flyers have also moved in, and I simply don't have enough to defeat them all at once. Unfortunately, Zephyr has already flowed in, so I really need to hurry. On my turn, Saffir gets a lucky 2% crit against a fire, killing them instantly, and Marion does decent damage to another with the Parthia. Kagetsu attacks a Wolf Knight, but misses his second hit and fails to get the kill, which is a problem. Rosado takes out a Corrupted Worm with a Sieglinde, and Elir takes out a Great Knight with a Biting Blade. I manage to get a 4 person freeze with a Dreadful Aura Thunder from Linden, and I end up needing to use my Goddess Dance early to take out the Wolf Knight that Getsu missed against, and somehow manage to clean up all of the flyers with a Warp Ragnarok from Veil. Zephyr moves in, but fortunately her equipment consists only of the Georgios and Thoron, neither of which can double, meaning that her attacks are not very lethal. Since I managed to clean up the majority of enemies last turn, all she can do is smash Kagetsu with 38 damage, which is not enough to kill him. I freeze her and deal with the remaining stragglers from the last wave, and then defeat her for a useless s rank weapon that I cannot use. Soon after, Gris has finally managed to walk all the way from the boss area alone, and I defeat him to get an extremely useful s rank Nova Tome. Chapter 24 of No Somnium Gage is a difficult map with a time limit of 15 turns and periodic unit movement shenanigans. Just like the previous chapter, this map can be made easier with Astro Storm Cheese, but unfortunately, in this specific circumstance, it gets complicated. Since Louis is dead, it gets difficult to defeat enough enemies to make using Astro Storm completely safe. But fortunately, that's not a particularly big deal to me, so I send Yunaka out immediately to hit Patsy Lear with an Astro Storm and leave her to die, because using a rescue staff to save her is not worth it. I have somehow managed to miss every single optional rescue staff in this playthrough, so I don't have very much to work with. I have managed to lure past Alir into moving towards us, however, this alone is not enough. If I don't do anything, past Alir will just get stuck behind a gargantuan clump of enemies. So we must hit her with an entrap staff as soon as possible, because I simply cannot afford to fight that large of a group. Unfortunately, I'm also running very low on entrap staff uses, and because I cannot inherit skills in this run, it is impossible to have both increased staff range and divine post for increased staff accuracy. If I try using entrap with Makai's increased staff range, then I'll be taking a big risk because Entrap has a bad hit rate against past Alir. And if I run out of Entrap staff uses, then I cannot reach the boss and the run will effectively be over. On the other end, using Entrap with my Byleth user would grant to increase hit rate, but also make his range a lot shorter, meaning that I'll have to wait for Alir to get closer to me before I try to Entrap. This has the unfortunate side effect of forcing me to fight or stall an entire map's worth of enemies for several turns. I decided to go for the second strategy and try to figure out a good way to proceed. If I stay in the central lane, then I'll be attacked from three fronts, the top, the bottom, and the right, which with our relatively weak team is untenable. I decided to consolidate into the center lane temporarily to convince many of the enemies and move to the center lane, and then I quickly move all my forces south. This causes the central area to clog up and means I only have to deal with two fronts, the top and a heavily diminished right. I retreat into a corner and block both paths with fire dragon veins, fighting off enemy flyers with my own, and I end up burning up most of my engage attacks just trying to survive. Unfortunately, past leader ends up moving quite awkwardly and gets stuck smack dab right in the middle of a gigantic enemy death ball. Fortunately, I am just barely in range to entrap her, but the positioning is quite unfortunate. But I decide I have to just go for it, because waiting longer will just make things worse. I have Hortensia use a Divine Post boosted entrap staff on Pasalir and succeed, moving her closer to my army. But Pasalir lands in a way that blocks Hortensia off, making it difficult to dance for her to use her goddess dance. I attack a corrupted sniper with Marin and manage to kill him with an extremely lucky 5% crit, saving me several actions and opening up Hortensia to be danced by Cito and allowing me to access the goddess dance. I then get to work on the boss, but unfortunately, nearly all of my attacks suffer from both low damage and a low hit rate. I begin by applying Draconic Hex to pass a leader, and then set up chain attacks with Sapphire and Merit. Merit, who I reclassed back into a wolf knight, repeatedly chain attacks with daggers to quickly apply 3 stacks of poison for 5 additional damage per hit, which adds up 
up to a lot. I proc chain attacks with Mavir and then get very lucky with a 39% hit from Fram and finish off past Alira's first health bar with even more chain attacks. I then get extremely lucky with a 5% Nova crit from Vale, which wipes out the boss's second health bar. And then I reorganize my units to use Goddess Dance and get lucky with a 48% hit from Rosado and only just barely manage to defeat past Alir with Alir. This was extremely close. If my luck was only slightly worse, then the run would have ended right here. Chapter 25 of No Somnio Engage is the penultimate map of the game where your armory is split into two groups. You are supposed to move the map quickly since many powerful Voidcurs reinforcements will spawn from the starting areas after several turns. Fortunately, it is pretty easy to avoid these reinforcements entirely by playing in a particular way. I use a rewarp and rescue sack to teleport my entire army into the central chamber and defeat all of the enemies there. And doing this grants me several turns of leeway as you're not expected to do this. A few turns later, two thieves spawn to open the doors to the left and right, but I managed to use my remaining trap stabs on both of them to defeat them before they can do so. By doing this, the doors will remain shut forever and all reinforcements are incapable of reaching me. At this point, I have managed to secure complete safety, so I repeatedly spam end turn until the numerous but technically finite reinforcements are exhausted. By not defeating more enemies than I have to, the map reaches a 64 enemy limit cap, which is apparently a thing, and they stop sparring. I then take this opportunity to train the veil to the greatest extent possible. I have just recently reset Vale's level from 40 back to 21 by using his second seal, meaning that she has 19 levels to gain. I have Vale repeatedly attack enemies for as little damage as possible to gain hit XP and then clear all of the enemies one by one. I start out with the stationary enemies near Lumera and then start clearing out the left and right wings of the map. After opening the doors and routing all the enemies, I am still not satisfied with the amount of Veil XP I have gotten. I make use of Veil's Veil Child class skill, Veil Spirit, which grants her free Emblem Charge every turn to repeatedly use Emblem Celica's Recover Staff for EXP. The Recover Staff has an absolute ton of base XP gain, meaning that even high level units can still gain decent experience from it, while lower level staffs like Heal or Mana would fall off. And more importantly, while Recover Staff uses are normally expensive and limited, Emblem Celica's Engage Recover Staff can be used infinitely, albeit limited by engage duration. So I then start spamming Recover to get Veil to level 60. I damage Seedal with Flame Dragon Mist and have Veil heal him for around 10 XP a pop, then have Seedal dance for Veil so he gains a similar amount of experience. And by doing this, both Veil and Seedal will gain levels at roughly the same rate, which is necessary to keep XP gain high. If your higher level unit heals a lower level unit, then the experience gain will be significantly diminished. So I repeatedly have Veil cast Recover on Seedal and have Seedal dance for Veil, spamming and turn to regain emblem meter for free. And in a process that takes more than 5 hours in total, I managed to get Cedo and Vale to their second level cap, which is effectively level 60, capping out Cedo's speed and giving Vale an absolutely disgusting amount of magic. Something that I feel is necessary to make the final battle possible. I then defeat Lumera, who has been watching us staff grind in the second to last chapter of the game for 563 turns to make a graceful exit to the map. In the final chapter of No Somnio Engage, we are forced to enter the Somnio, which ends the run. Just kidding. I entered the Forbidden Sky Castle and awakened the Forbidden One before going to the balcony to access the final battle. I have spent all my remaining gold to give all my units tonics for every stat and then begin. The final map of Fire Emblem Engage has two distinct phases. In the first phase, you fight Sombra and 12 Corrupted that all wield S rank weapons. These enemies are really strong, but there aren't that many of them, and your health and emblems will refresh at the end of the phase. So I burn all of my emblem attacks and take out Sombra with Veil, and now the real map begins. Phase 2 begins with Sombra transforming into a large dragon that occupies 25 tiles and creating a barrier that nullifies all attacks. This barrier can be weakened by defeating Dark Emblems which represent major Fire Emblem villains that spawn in the corners of the map. They are vulnerable to matching emblems for their respective games. To the left, we have Shadow Dragon Medias who I take out with Kagetsu and Mark. To the right, we have Dark God Loptus who I defeat with a level 60 Seedo armed with Sigurd's Tearfing. This weakens Sombra's barrier from reducing damage by 100% to 70% that we can now do minimal amounts of damage. Right now, it's not enough to actually defeat Sombra, but even dealing one damage will allow me to apply poison. I attack Sombra with Merin, applying a poison stack, and leave her as the only unit in his range, which will make him use a single target attack, allowing him to be counterattacked for another poison stack. At this point, the real threats of this map start appearing. This map has, among other powerful enemies, infinitely spawning Wyvern Knights and Griffin Knights. The Wyverns are strong but manageable, while the Griffin Knights are true threats. They are incredibly tanky and have 45 speed. 
speed. Without inherited skills or forged weapons, it is practically impossible to one round them outside of limited use and gauge attacks, and then make a push towards the other two dark emblems. If I don't hurry, then I'll be overwhelmed with reinforcements faster than I can kill them, so I must go as quickly as I can. Veo uses her level 60 stats to fully exploit Nova, which is an S rank Brave Tome, which allows her to easily destroy generals in one round. I cast Fracture on Sombron to nullify his counter attacks for one round so I can attack with Merit and land another poison stack for the maximum of three, which amounts to a total of plus five damage per hit. And all the while, Kagetsu one rounds enemy wyverns with a falchion, which ends up being surprisingly useful. I continue fighting upwards and Fram engages with Micaiah to use the Thani for the first and last time to kill a general. I manage to clear all the enemies nearby me, but several more start approaching from the top. So I use an AoE rewarp to reposition my units. I fracture Sombron again to disable his counter attacks and safely attack with Linden to hit him with a dreadful aura, which propagates to all enemies adjacent to him, which is a lot since he is very big. Four enemies are frozen, which allows me to advance with more confidence. I advance toward the upper right with haste, using a Makai Enhanced Rewarp to teleport many units up even faster. I have to hurry to stay ahead of the reinforcements, though I cannot easily fight without expending limited resources. I attack the Dark Bishop Veld, who is a bold knight with Higetsu's poax. The Dark Emblems are stationary, so if I'm able to one round them on player phase, then I can one round them again on enemy phase when they attack. Higetsu attacks, but unfortunately I miss a 90% hit, and he fails to get the kill, which is how you say, fucking bullshit. Regardless, I manage to clear the health bar with a thorn from Pedreo which salvages the situation. I hit Sombron with yet another dreadful aura freeze to freeze another good chunk of enemies, and I use Makaya to rewarp even more units forward to clear the unfrozen enemy units, even expanding a goddess stance to do so, but unfortunately it's not enough, and an enemy mage manages to sneak through and kill Safir with Elwind, but on the plus side the Dark Bishop kills himself with enemy phase against Kagetsu's Poax. I move Veil forward to the Warfather Duma in the upper left and take out his first health bar with an Echo Nova, using the second hit with a weaker tome to leave him more vulnerable. By defeating all four emblems, he will completely break Sombron's barrier, removing his damage reduction entirely, but on manning difficulty, this only lasts one turn but before Sombron restores to the foe and summons four more emblems. Because the reinforcements on this map are too strong, if I allow that to happen, I will just die. So I must time the defeat of the fourth dark emblem carefully and defeat Sombra on the same turn. At this point, Sombra casts a disengage and forcibly disengages all my emblems, which is actually beneficial as it will allow me to use my goddess dance again more quickly. I prepare to set up for the kill. With three dark emblems defeated, the damage reduction drops to only 50%, allowing me to deal decent chip damage. I recharge my emblem with emblem energies and by attacking enemies, and I place Veil in rage of the Warfather Juba so he can defeat himself on enemy phase, allowing me to leverage all my actions to defeat Sombra. The Warfather defeats himself on enemy phase, and Sombra whiffs his Howling Beam, hitting absolutely nobody. With the fourth Dark Emblem defeated, Sombra's barrier is broken, and I go for the kill. I attack with Linden first to apply Draconic Hex to reduce Sombra's stats, and take down his chipped down health bar with Gold Mary and Malvier, the majority of whose damage comes from poison stacks I applied at the start of the map. I then attack with Veil, who after being grinded at level 60 has a perfect one shot on Sombra with Nova, taking out his second bar. His third health bar goes down after attacking with Pandreo, Rosado, and Marin, and for his final health bar, I attack with Alir and Kagetsu, leaving him with only 4 HP. I have so many remaining actions left, I decide to gamble for a meme kill, and I have an unleveled Tamara attack with a Brianak, with all 5 damage that she can do coming entirely from poison, as she would normally do 0. The chain attack misses, and Tamara throws a Brianak, dealing 5 damage and defeating Sombra once and for all, finally completing Fire Emblem Engage without using any any of the Somnios features. This concludes my Fire Emblem Engage No Somnio Maddening Iron Man. I will consider this to be one of the most difficult challenge runs that you can do in Fire Emblem Engage, and completing it was quite the adventure. So now I'd like to do a comprehensive post-mortem on the challenge and to discuss what strategies end up being useful and viable. The difficulty of this challenge starts at around the same compared to a normal Fire Emblem Engage Maddening playthrough, but soon it diverges and becomes much more difficult, especially after Chapter 17. Early on, the main divergence is the absence of early DLC bonuses, but later on the lack of inherited skills, forges, and engraves causes many limitations on what strategies and units are viable. On the screen is a quick rudimentary tier list that I made after I beat the game about how useful I think characters and emblems are, but don't take it too seriously because I was not able to explore that many characters and I have many gaps in my knowledge here. Whether a unit is good or not in the No Somnial Challenge depends greatly on how well they can operate without resource investment. The only thing that can really invest into units are additional levels, but many units frankly 
likely do not become usable in the maddening endgame only by being at an appropriate level. To be useful, the unit must have decent damage, speed, and accuracy out of the box because the lack of skills, engraves, and forges makes it utterly impossible to patch up deficiencies. Units like Hagetsu and Pangeo just work, but even then, they still need the training to be endgame viable. Some filler units can still be useful because of staff and chain attack utility, but largely the useful units mirror the ones that are generally considered to be good in base and gauge. Some units may also be endgame viable, but they have such a rocky start that it becomes impossible to actually use them in early chapters, requiring extensive unconventional training, like the use of Micaiah heal spam in paradox chapters or skirmishes. Even if these characters don't become useful just by playing normally, they can still contribute a lot to the run just because the amount of characters that are endgame viable is very limited. And this was my logic behind characters like Rosado and Veil, who are frankly not too useful at base level when they arrive. And as such, one thing that I think is absolutely critical to the success of the run is completing emblem paralogs, both for the extra experience and but also for the ability to max out bond levels. The sheer amount of free stats that you get from leveling up bond is definitely not to be underestimated, and it effectively amounts to several free stat boosts per paralog. Another interesting thing that I noticed was that the relative usefulness of various weapons also changed, with some weapon types becoming much worse without the additional customization options. Overall, I think swords and tomes wound up being the best weapon types, primarily because of their high accuracy. Bows are heavily gipped by the lack of bonus might forges and engraves, which makes one-shotting late fires nearly impossible. Lances and axes generally suffer greatly from accuracy and weight issues that largely cannot be accommodated for without the Somnium. Daggers are mainly useful for stacking poison on late boss units with chain attacks, but their low might combined with the fact that most dagger units have low strength made them pretty mediocre. And just like in the base game, arts still suck. I think the most useful weapon in this run, hilariously, actually ended up being the Silver Sword of all things because of its decent might, low weight, and most importantly, high accuracy. And the utility of niche weapons like the Hurricane Axe in the mid game and the Pole Axe in the late game was also a pleasant surprise, but even then, they were only usable by units like Kagetsu who have enough accuracy and speed without investment to mitigate the low base hit and high weight. Any of the cheese and staff strategies in this run end up being very similar to that of the base game, with various choke points, Astro Storm Luring, and warp strategy is still working mostly as intended, barring some that require skill combinations. And I think many of these strategies, while not necessarily necessary, are heavily advantageous in this run because late game enemies are still very difficult to fight in large quantities. I wound up completing the final run in around 42 hours of playtime, which is actually even less than my other playthroughs, which I guess goes to show that skipping all the Somnium management does save you time. Overall, this was a fun challenge, but uh, I would not recommend that you do it. Anyway, if you like this video, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. I put months of work into each of these big series, so if you want to support future projects like this, consider joining me as a YouTube member or contributing to my Patreon. Thanks for watching and see you all next time.